true worshipers are always glad to be in the house. And this is why we have the words of the text, I was glad. Glad in the Hebrew means to brighten up. Looks like some folk in here need to brighten up today. It means to cheer up. Some of y'all look kind of sad. It looks, it means to, to make glad. It means to make joyful. It means to be merry. It means to cause to rejoice. They said we got excited when somebody said, let's go to church. It lets go, go, go is human locomotion in the Hebrew. It's motion, it's moving from point A to point B. It's progress, it's leaving from where you were and going where God wants you to be. Go also has a figurative meaning though in the Hebrew and that idea is of one's lifestyle. Because the concept of go, that human locomotion is the New Testament Greek equivalent to walking. So in a figurative sense, going has to do with how we live our continuing relationship with God. I think they were so excited to be going to worship because number one, they had a lifestyle that was consistent with a desire to dwell in the presence of God. And number two, they wanted to hear the word of God from the man of God. See, it's hard to want to dwell in a person's presence or hear from a person when you don't have a positive ongoing relationship with that person. And by the way, I'm not talking about just coming to church because that's what we can do. You can be in sin and still come to church. I'm talking about people who were on fire, people that were excited at the opportunity that God let them live another day so that they could come to the public place to worship him in spirit and in truth. They were excited about being in God's house. You see, some of us come to church, and then there's some of us that came to worship. I wish I had a witness. There's a difference between coming to church and coming to worship. If you come to church, you're going to get up and leave church. But if you came to worship, your worship leaves with you. And when you're not living right, there's no urgency to come to church. There's no urgency to be in worship. When you're not living right, there's no urgency to want to be in the presence of God. When you're not living right, you really would rather run and hide. Y'all remember Adam and Eve? in the Garden of Eden when they knew that they were no longer in fellowship with God, when they knew that they had messed up, they weren't running to God, they were running from God. You remember Jonah, God gave him an assignment, but when he disagreed with the assignment, he wasn't running to God, but he was running from God. But these people in the text couldn't wait to get in the presence of Almighty God. Because for them, anticipating being in the presence of the Lord also meant hearing from God. And that's why you ought to always praise God for the preacher. The preacher is the mouthpiece of God. It's God's messenger to your heart. The Galahan of the gospel. He's the watchman on the wall watching out for your soul. He is the under shepherd leading and guiding you as the Lord leads him. He is charged with speaking what God says to his people. The text suggests that they were anxious to get to the Lord's house. Now, in the Hebrew, that word house can be a tent, can be a hut, can be a mansion, it can be a palace, or it could be a temple. Regardless of what the building is like, it's a dwelling place. It's a place where somebody lives. These people were going to where they knew the Lord lived because it was the Lord that they wanted to encounter. They were on their way to God's house. Now, when you read the text carefully, you'll see that there were some things that they just knew ought to go on when they got to the Lord's house. Now, they didn't go, again, because it was their day to sing. That's not why they went. They didn't go because they were supposed to usher. They didn't go because they had a title and a special seat. No, they went because they wanted to give God some praise. They came to fellowship with each other. You'll see that in verse 4, because they saw themselves as tribes. Now, in the Hebrew, the word tribe really means rod or staff, because those were the instruments used by the shepherd not only to rule the sheep, but to keep the sheep together. So then a tribe was really no more than a family. So the Hebrews were excited, now watch this, at the opportunity to fellowship with the rest of the family because they saw themselves as members of the same tribe or members of the same family. Now, Dr. J.A. Jones is a great man, but his name is Jones. I'm Damon Jones. We might be from different tribes, 
but I promise you we're in the same family. I wish I had a witness in here. Pastor Watson and I don't even have the same last name, but I promise you we're still brothers in the same family. I wish I really had some help in here. They just couldn't wait to see each other. And in the same way, we are supposed to be family with God as our Father, we as brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, the one thing that keeps families together better than anything else is love. And just about all the one another statements in the Bible or exhortations in the New Testament are really demonstrations of love in action. As a matter of fact, in the New Testament, the words one another are used somewhere around 58 times, and about 40 of those times it was used only by the Apostle Paul. Romans chapter 12, verse 5, we are members one of another. Romans chapter 12, verse 10, we should be devoted one to another. Romans 12, 10, we should honor one another above ourselves. Romans 15, 5, we should be of the same mind with one another. Romans 15, 14, we ought to admonish one another. Romans 16, 3 to 6, we ought to greet one another. Galatians 5, 13, we ought to serve one another. Galatians 6, 2, we ought to bear one another's burdens. Ephesians 4, we ought to bear with one another. Ephesians 5, 21, we ought to submit one to another. 1 Thessalonians 5, we ought to encourage one another. We are all a part of God's family, and if we are all a part of God's family, then we ought to act like we're a part of God's family. But let me hurry up. The text says that there's something else that they came to do when they came to God's house. Verse 4, they came to give thanks to the name of the Lord. In other words, they came in not as though they were God's gift to the worship. You know how some people come in and they just sit down, they won't smile, they won't say amen, they will act like they don't feel no joy, they just kind of sit there like they're God's gift to the worship. Well, somebody needs to know that you are not God's gift to the worship. God has blessed you and given you another day so that you can attend the worship. I wish I had some help in here. But these people came with an attitude of gratitude. They came with an appreciation in their spirit. They came to tell God, thank you. And I was just kind of wondering if there's anybody in here that's got something they want to thank God for. Is there anybody that has an attitude of gratitude? Has anybody been good to the king? Has anybody in the house ever expressed thanks to God? The stuff that he has done for you. I know things have not gone all the time the way you want things to go, but you can't stand here and say that God ain't good. He's good when he ain't doing what you want him to do. He's good when he is doing what you do. He's just good irregardless of me and you. I don't know about you, but aren't you better? Aren't you stronger? Aren't you wiser? Just because of what God has done in your life? Now, you know what? I need some old saints. Old saints know how to say thank you. Old, old saints know something about appreciating the Lord. They, they, they had a little bit, but they knew how to stretch that thing. Didn't have much, but they were thankful for whatever they had. They understood that everything that they had came from the Lord. I wish I had some old saints in here that could teach us how to say thank you. Uh, I came out of old school. I grew up in Mount Zion Baptist Church at 50th and Woodland in Southwest Philly. My pastor was Dr. Hiawatha Coleman, and I sat at his feet the entire time he was alive. And I came to tell you something. Old folk know how to say thank you. Old folk know how to appreciate what the Lord gives them. And I grew up Baptist. I am Baptist. I'm going to be Baptist. And I remember all them Baptist prayers that we used to pray. Thank you for last night's laying down and this morning's uprising. Thank you for keeping me while I slept and slumbered. Thank you for blessing us to see another day. Thank you that last night my bed wasn't my cooling board. Thank you for a reasonable portion of health and strength. Thank you for the roof over our heads, clothes on our back, food on our table. Thank you for your darling son Jesus who came and died on the cross and got up early Sunday morning with all power in his hand just to save us we ought to tell him thank you they came to thank God for what God had done in their lives and for what he means to them well, then verse 6 says that they also did something else that I thought was real interesting verse 6 says that they also prayed for the peace of the city of Jerusalem. Now it seems that these people were not content to just have a good time among themselves. They weren't just content to come in church and have a good shouting time and then leave and go on back home till next Sunday. 
Huh? That's not what they, that's not what they did. It's not how they felt. Being in the presence of God and thanking him for how he had blessed them and fellowshipping with each other was not enough. These people were not only internally focused, but they had external concerns. Because once you leave the church house, you have to live in the city. Amen, somebody. So these people thought enough of the city where they were to pray for the peace in that city. Now, I would suggest today that a church is not a church if it does not impact the community where it is. Come on, help me somebody. These people thought enough about Jerusalem to pray for that city. And if y'all don't mind me saying so, I think we ought to pray for this city. I think we ought to be praying for Camden. Y'all ain't that far from Philly, just a little trip over the bridge, and y'all got some of the same old issues that we got going on in Philly. I think we ought to be praying for Camden, and I think we ought to be praying for Philadelphia. I pray all the time for North Philly, South Philly, West Philly, Southwest Philly, Germantown, Nashtown, Fishtown, Mount Airy, Northeast, Mantua, Center City. I pray all the time for the different parts of the city where I am. We ought to pray for the mayor and city council and every elected official, social worker, city workers, police officers, firefighters, correctional officers, and all those wonderful people that work in our schools all day long with our children. We need to pray for the city. Every county, every borough, every municipality. We ought to be praying for the commonwealth. We ought to be praying for the state. Governor, and we got a governor on our side that don't care nothing about public education. I wish I had a witness. We ought to be praying for guys like that. We ought to be praying also for that bad brother in the Oval Office. I said we ought to be praying for that bad brother flying around here on Air Force One. We ought to be praying for the United States of America. We ought to be praying for our nation. We ought to be praying about what's going on all around the world. If ever there was a time that our cities need to pray, it's right now. Kids killing kids and having babies, drug users, drug abusers, homosexuality, lesbianism, prostitution, dangerous streets, senseless violence, children being neglected and mistreated and abused and shot and kidnapped from school, substandard housing, high unemployment, substandard public education, a prison industrial complex that's trying to take generations of black men back to Jim Crowism, and now we got rogue police officers walking around executing black men at will. If ever there was a time to pray for our cities, it's now. That's why the Bible says, if my people who are called by my name just humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land. And so I'm just trying to tell you today that these people in the text were glad to be in the Lord's house. And as a matter of fact, they got excited before they even got to the house. If you really got a bona fide praise in you, then you can't hold it till you get to the church house. God has been good to you. You can't contain that. The Lord has blessed you. You can't be cool about that. If you sure enough saved, sometimes you're going to have to just let it out. Sometimes you're going to have to let it out before your feet enter the building. Worship was not something they did just when they got to the house of God. It was a state of mind and a state of heart before they even left home. When they woke up in the morning, they had a praise on their lips. When they put their feet down on the floor, they had a praise in their lips. When they went down to the kitchen and had food on the table, they had praise on their lips. When they looked in the closet and had clothes to wear, they had a praise on their lips came to tell somebody when we come to God's house there ought to be a praise in your heart and a praise on your lips came to tell somebody that the Lord's house is a place of worship it is a place where you can magnify the Lord it is a place where you can thank him for his amazing grace it is a place where you can bless him for his power. I said it is a place where you can exalt him for his wisdom. It is a place where you can adore him for his presence. 
and it is a place where you can bless him for what he's done. So when you come to church, you ought not sit like a statue, but you ought to be able to give God some praise. If he brought you from a mighty long way, then you ought to give God some praise. Because when you give God the praise, he will lift your burdens. I said when you give God the praise, he will soothe your doubts and he'll calm your fears. When you give God the praise, he will revive your soul and he'll restore your joy. When you give God the praise, he'll fill your cup until it overflows. I said when you give God the praise, you know when the praises go up? I said when the praises go up, I wish I had a witness. I said when the praises go up, the blessings will come down. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. And so I'm glad. I said I'm glad. I said I'm glad to be in the service one more time. He did not have to let me live, but I'm glad. Oh, I'm glad to be in the service one more time. Am I right about it? Am I right about it? Anybody glad? Anybody glad? Anybody glad to be in the service? Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad? Oh, aren't you glad? 